Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our final event of the 2023 year. And of course, it's um, it's a very important and a difficult event. And um, to uh, where we're going to learn from Dr. Hassan Abusitta about um, the situation in Gaza. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief uh, bio of our um, speakers today. Um, and this is, like I mentioned, this is the last event of the 2023 year for the Palestine uh, uh, Program for Health and Human Rights, which is a joint um, program between um, the Institute of Community and Public Health at Birzeit University and the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. And my name is uh, Liam Hamouda, and I'm one of the co-directors of uh, the program. Uh, today, we have two uh, guests that we are very grateful that they actually um, gave us their time and we um we will be learning a lot i'm sure um just on recent events but also in thinking about them in the broader uh perspective so uh we have dr vasan abusitta who i think most of you have already know um and have heard from throughout especially in the last two months dr vasan abusitta is a british a palestinian plastic and reconstructive surgeon who has who spent the, uh, several weeks in Gaza during the last, um, this latest um, war. Um, and, but he has over 30 years of experience as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, um, specializing in war wounds. He's worked in various conflict and war zones, including Iraq, Syria, South Lebanon, Yemen, and uh, the Gaza Strip. He's also the co founder of the Conflict Medicine Program at AUB's Global um, Health Institute. Um, and in addition to his clinical work, he has um, a distinguished uh, track record as an educator. He's an honorary senior lecturer at the Center for Blast Injury Studies at Imperial College Lon uh, London. Um, he's also a visiting senior lecturer at the Conflict and Health Research Group uh, at, the, at the Faculty of Life Sciences and Medicine at King's College London. Um, and he serves as a reviewer at the UK's National Institute of Health Research uh, and as a member of its International Funding Committee. And he's also published extensively on all aspects of facial surgery and war injuries, including um, uh, uh, having written medical textbooks called Reconstructing the War Injured Patient and the War Injured Child from the Point of, view, uh, point of Injury Treatment Through Management and Continuum of Care. Um, and he's also very active in various um, humanitarian organizations and um, health organizations both regionally and internationally. Um, and we also have uh, Dr. Omar Duwashi with us today. Uh, Omar Duwashi is an Associate Professor of Medical Anthropology and Global Health at Rutgers University. His research and practice are centered on the dynamics of war and healthcare in Iraq and the broader Middle East. Before joining Rutgers, he was the uh, he was at the American University of Beirut, where he and Dr. Hassan Abusitte co-founded the Conflict Medicine Program at AUB's Global Health Institute. His acclaimed book, Ungovernable Life, Mandatory Medicine and Statecraft in Iraq, explores the evolution of Iraqi medicine during the 20th century's colonial and post-colonial periods. And his upcoming book, drawn on nearly two decades of ethnographic research and practice, examines the repercussions of prolonged Middle Eastern conflicts on modern healthcare, the human body, and the rise of war biology. Uh, so just to give you a sense of our format today, we're going to be starting with Dr. Hassan, um, who will uh, reflect both on recent events and his own experience in Gaza. Um, following uh, Dr. Hassan's presentation, Dr. Ahmed will um, will uh, reflect on that presentation and kind of put it into the broader perspective and then engage with Hassan with uh, over a, uh, a few questions. Um, so it'll be a conversation between the two for a bit, and then we're going to open it up uh, for general questions from the audience. Uh, you can put your questions into the Q&A uh, box and we will be checking them and we'll um, try to also group similar questions together just for the sake of time. Uh, towards the end. And just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Um, and we thank you all for making the time to join us today. And we thank our speakers for also for their time and their um, uh, for sharing their time and their expertise with us um, uh, today. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Hassan. Thank you very much, Wean. Thank you uh, for this um, invitation. Really, um, 
uh, uh, the talk was going to be um, ordered differently today, but um, recent events or today's events um, um, necessitate me to start with with um, uh, talking about my uh, friend and my colleague and and someone who has just uh, been an amazing uh, health professional throughout this war, uh, Dr. Mohammed Abed. Dr. Abed and I first met during the marches of return um, when um, um, MSF um, jointly with Lauda Hospital set up a, a limb reconstruction unit to try to deal with the huge number of Palestinian demonstrators who had been shot by Israeli snipers in the lower limb, necessitating prolonged and complex um, orthoplastic uh, reconstruction of their limbs. Um, Dr. Abed, then uh, uh, um, we were together during the 2021 war. And then at the beginning of this war, uh, we I ran into him uh, initially at Lauda when I went up to Lauda in Jabalia camp in the far north of Gaza uh, uh, for a brief period um, at the beginning of the war, where he was still doing orthoplastic limb reconstruction. Um, and then uh, uh, when um, after um, Lauda received a, a, a threat from the Israeli army that it had to uh, evacuate um, the hospital, and the decision was made that we at least transferred the limb reconstruction unit and its patients, particularly the post-op patients, to Shifa Hospital that uh, uh, we, uh, we went to Shifa together. And, and we worked uh, a lot of the days together um, uh, um, in, in Shifa as, as, uh, as in the main operating room, him as an orthopedic surgeon and stabilizing the fractures and, and myself as a plastic surgeon, trying to provide soft tissue cover for these um, complex injuries. Dr. Abed um, chose to stay at Shifa Hospital when the Israeli army surrounded the hospital and remained with his patient throughout the 10 days that the Israelis, 10 days to two weeks that the Israelis had completely surrounded the hospital, cut off its water supply and food supply, um, and uh, stayed there. Uh, until the Israeli army withdrew from around the hospital and was instrumental in evacuating his patients. After that, he moved back up north to the Indonesian hospital uh, on the edges of um, a Jabalia refugee camp in the far north, where he continued to work at the Indonesian hospital despite repeated Israeli attacks on the hospital and multiple uh, missile attacks. When the hospital finally collapsed as a result of the Israeli land invasion, he moved uh, uh, back to Lauda Hospital, which is further in, uh, in the middle of Jabalia camp. The Israelis then repeatedly attacked uh, Jabalia, uh, uh, Lauda Hospital, fired a missile into the doctor's lounge where Three of our colleagues were uh, killed. Uh, uh, three of the, the young surgeons working uh, there were killed. And then a few days later, fired a missile at the uh, medical director's office. And luckily, he wasn't there. This morning, uh, uh, Dr. Abed was conducting his war round to check up on his post-operative patient. And he, as he passed in front of one of the windows, he was shot by an Israeli sniper in the abdomen. Uh, Dr. Abed uh, uh, was wounded and had to be taken to the operating room. He is still um, alive, but suffers from uh, abdominal wounds. And really the story of Dr. Abed, not just in this uh, war, but in previous wars, is really uh, uh, a shining indication of how the Palestinian 
uh, health uh, workers have fought back against the strategy of intentional dismantlement and destruction of the Palestinian health sector. Um, from the moment the Israelis chose to target El, El, the Baptist Ahli Hospital and the failure of uh, the international community to see this as a litmus test at, uh, for its resolve. And then Israel then uh, 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 moved full gear into taking apart the, the, the health system, uh, first by attacking the four uh, pediatric hospitals and then uh, uh, the cancer hospital in, in the central area and then attacking uh, uh, um, the um, ophthalmology hospital and the psychiatric hospital. And then the whole discourse about Shifa and the militarization of Shifa and that whole narrative about how Shifa is the center of some great command and control network, uh, then attacking Shifa Hospital, um, and then moving on to attack the Indonesian hospital until it was destroyed, and now this attack. And throughout all of these attacks, tens and hundreds of Palestinian doctors and nurses and paramedics and ambulance men have resisted this uh, uh, attempt at what is really using humanitarian catastrophe to ensure that ethnic cleansing of Gaza uh, continues even if the war were to stop now. This catastrophization of the, or the creation of a perfect self-feeding catastrophe through the destruction of the health system, destruction of 60% of the houses in Gaza, uh, water desalination plant, um, water and sewage treatment plant, um, all of which uh, aims at making Gaza into a death world which is uninhabitable, where people, where even those who remain steadfast, and they're still, despite all of these attacks, 700 to 800,000 Palestinians in the northern part of Gaza, even those who stay steadfast would have to leave eventually. If we uh, step back and look at the uh, 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 war and really the magnitude of killing where uh, 1% uh, of Gaza's children have already been killed, 10,000, with a further 20 to 25,000 wounded, uh, where almost now 19,000 have been killed in total and uh, 50,000 have been wounded. In such a short uh, time, uh, just 50 days, uh, just over 50 days, is really a, an indicator of how uh, uh, this catastrophization requires at its center a destruction of the health system so that those wounded are left to die slowly in front of their families uh, from untreated wounds, where uh, chronic non-communicable diseases return to becoming uh, life-threatening uh, emergency, um, where the diabetics are unable to, to receive insulin, where asthmatics cannot find inhalers and Ventolin, where all around us uh, 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 diseases that had been treated become fatal. And one, now we see the next phase of this catastrophization, which is the uh, 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 beginning of infectious diseases epidemics, starting with hepatitis uh, and upper respiratory tract infection. As a result of this lethal combination of malnutrition uh, uh, catastrophic secondary to wounding an untreated wound and then uh, uh, overcrowding uh, with poor water and, and sewage systems in these uh, schools that have become major uh, 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 sanctuaries for the internally display. All of this um, and preventing any uh, uh, meaningful resupply of medication or uh, uh, consumables that would be necessary for 
the hospitals to, to, to treat their patients. And so even in, even in uh, uh, the southern part of Gaza, where the three major hospitals are Shuhada uh, al-Aqsa and uh, Nasser in Khan Yunis and the European hospital in Rafah, the shortage of medical equipment, the shortage of consumables, the shortage of medication means that even though these hospitals are physically intact, the capacity of their operating rooms is so diminished that they are not able to provide uh, uh, the kind of medical care that even a small percentage of the wounded. So uh, the wounded in the southern part of Gaza are just being bandaged, uh, and uh, left uh, without definitive treatment to these injuries. Um, unless they're extremely life-threatening critical injuries, there is no operating room capacity for them. And even the, uh, l- the latest small addition to the capacity in the south, the Jordanian government's field hospital, was yesterday the target of Israeli artillery to ensure that they, it cannot provide any added benefit to the Palestinians. Awesome. If it is that, yes. But if you can just move closer to the microphone, because the voice keeps dropping sometimes. Ah, Thank you. Okay. So uh, it's that uh, uh, um, um, systematic destruction that, that we lived in from the very beginning of the war. Um, on the tenth of uh, on the tenth of um, October, being stuck in a house for twenty four hours after arriving in Gaza on the Monday, I managed to make my way through uh, Shifa to Shifa Hospital, and from the very start, the sheer number of wounded, the complexity and the severity of the injuries uh, was, um, in a way able to come to early on consume the uh, capacity and the consumables and uh, uh, required material for the health system early on um, the um this total bed capacity uh, then had to face a, a number of wounded that now uh, reaches 50,000, while 70% of that capacity was then being degraded by systematic attacks and the denial of any kind of resupply of the material. Initially, we started running out of antiseptic solutions and then uh, blades and uh, uh, specialized dressings for burns and then uh, morphine and proper analgesics for uh, 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 pain relief. And then eventually, by the end of the war, we had run out of um, ketamine and then uh, uh, run out of propofol and anesthetic. And it was at five o'clock on that morning uh, uh, when I left Ahli Hospital that... Um, we had been operating throughout the day um, on uh, p- patients wounded in, in a missile attack on a, a, ma- a mosque. And it was five o'clock that, that we had run out of anesthetic uh, medication and, and, and the uh, uh, Baptist Ahli Hospital, which was the last remaining hospital in Gaza City, uh, we had to stop the, the, the OR. And that's when we made the decision to go to the south and throughout the, this these 43 days one could see through the wounds the intent of this war we had everything from uh, incendiary bombs that would uh, cause major uh, large body surface area uh, full thickness burns uh, with no shrapnel to uh, uh, new fragmentary hellfire missiles that would disintegrate into shards and discs of metal and cause amputations and shrapnel injuries 
uh, in a huge number and the amputations were like guillotine amputations at high levels in the limbs to the phosphorus, white phosphorus burns that we had seen in 2009 and started seeing again initially in the north, uh, uh, but uh, uh, later on uh, um, against uh, people fleeing from uh, the Shata beach camp uh, in Gaza. And um, while in, in uh, the Baptist hospital, uh, patients who were shot with uh, uh, high velocity bullets fired from the Baptist Hospital. So all of these injuries uh, uh, were so overwhelming to the system that eventually it consumed it, but that wasn't enough. Then there was the direct attacks on the hospitals and the whole narrative that centers around uh, 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 militarizing uh, hospitals and demonizing those within them and uh, securitizing the, the value of their lives by arguing that, well, they only deserve to live if there is no security association with them. And if there is a security association with them, then uh, uh, with these hospitals, then it's acceptable to attack a hospital like Shifa, which had 2,000 wounded and 50,000 internally displaced. Moving forward, I think the war, the Israelis will attempt to continue the war even after the ceasefire, whenever that comes by uh, insisting on a total siege that prevents the rebuilding of houses, prevents the re, uh, uh, supply of hospitals and uh, repair to the health system that it needs to be able to stand on its two feet, uh, prevents medical teams from going in to try to overcome the huge number of wounded, 70 to 80 percent of will need further so you're looking at 70 to 80 percent of wounded, uh, uh, 70 to 80 uh, 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 rehabilitation that will be required for a lot of these wounds that have now been neglected and left for over 50. Um, at Imperial College, which, where we had had um, a project with, with the pediatric limb prosthetics unit at uh, uh, in Gaza, and um, we estimate that as a result of this war only, there's between 900 and 1,500 pediatric amputations, many of, we, uh, of whom are multiple amputations. So you can imagine the kind of magnitude of what's facing the health system. And what will be the system from being rebuilt, stop people from rebuilding their houses, keep the internally displaced in schools, uh, stop the hospitals that had been caught bombed from ever teaching again because uh, a lot of their academics have already been killed and all of their buildings have been completely wiped out. So I will um, stop there because I think there's much more use in a kind of one-to-one -one discussion um, than, than me going on and on. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, Hassan. So I'll hand it over to Ahmed. Thank you, uh, we, um, thank you, Hassan, for this incredible testimony and for all the work that you've been doing and uh, and and for being there for your patients and uh, um, and actually to come out of this war to tell us about the horrors that are ongoing there. Um, I, I'm going to be uh, pretty short uh, in my response, so I can kind of maybe allow more uh, Q&A uh, with Rassan and also uh, Q&A with the audience. So um, I would uh, my my kind of first uh, uh, 
reflection here uh, revolves around the idea of how in modern uh, warfare, and specifically in the Middle East, uh, under the uh, the ages of the war on terror, we have seen a massive and systemic destruction of healthcare as becoming increasingly a strategy of war. Uh, these, the strategy. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I grew up in Iraq and I worked there as a doctor in the 1990s. And the there is a, an incredible kind of uh, haunting deja vu coming out of uh, what I'm seeing today in Gaza in relationship to the destruction of infrastructure, uh, water, electricity, the basics of healthcare, uh, the basics uh, kind of for functioning uh, for the hospital and the clinic. And at the same time, kind of a siege that that prevented the movement of uh, of uh, medications into the uh, into the hospital. This definitely was a um, uh, a very important sign of how healthcare and medicine becomes a kind of a target of of these war of, of war in general. But what we see today in Gaza uh, is something probably unprecedented in the scale and the scope and the pace of uh, of, destru of destruction we haven't seen elsewhere. The kind of the closest uh, example one could uh, relate to is what happened in Mosul in, uh, in to, uh, 2016, 2017, where over a nine month uh, period, uh, there was a major military uh, urban operation that destroyed around uh, more than two thirds of uh, Mosul's healthcare, killed around 11,000 to 12,000 people and destroyed the entire kind of infrastructure of the city. But mind you, the numbers, uh, the, you have a, a nine month operation, which was actually until then was seen as one of the most, the, the one of the largest scale urban operations since the Second World War, but until probably October 7th. But what we see today is the kind of the acceleration of, of, of death, acceleration of injury, acceleration of destruction in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, the 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 other kind of aspect of this destruction of the clinic or of the hospital or of manufacturing this public health dystopia uh, is the actually targeting of the witnesses of the uh, the uh, those the doctors specifically and the paramedics who are working and and actually witnessing these everyday horrors of uh, of these wars so i think the point that Rassan made in the beginning about uh, his colleague uh, and the kind of the, the the rate of the killing of of doctors really testifies to this idea of eradicating also some kind of the witnessing of what's happening in 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 uh, in, in in these in this in the setting, the second point that I want to really kind of uh, uh, raise here, which Hassan kind of also touched on, is this rise of all kinds of ailments and afflictions that emerge from this problem. The the kind of the the bio the biological landscape of these wounds, uh, of these infections, of these chronic diseases, over infections, over uh, surgical problems all compounded in the same place and i and i and i think Hassan could definitely kind of maybe uh, imagine or can tell us what is the long term consequences of uh, of of uh, these tragedies these uh, this idea that you are destroying healthcare and uh, you're 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 killing and 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 destroying uh, 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 civilian life, but at the same time preventing all pro possibilities of repair in the future. Um, so so I I feel these this is something that would be really important to to highlight because what we're going to be witnessing is really I feel like maybe not not even seen before in terms of a, of a medical tragedy. Uh, uh, unfolding a humanitarian tragedy in in Gaza that has entered a very uncharted territory at this point. Um, the th the last point that I want to make is to kind of bring it back to the everyday life and the population of of Gaza. Uh, and I spoke with to about this with Rassan, and maybe he can kind of elaborate on it a little bit more. I guess with the collapse of these these uh, healthcare infrastructures, what we see is that people themselves become infrastructure. People become lifelines for each other. Uh, we see, I know Hassan could speak more about a couple of stories where these children without uh, parents, 
become immediately taking care of, of other uh, uh, people in the hospital, um, uh, people saving each other's lives, uh, people kind of uh, uh, working to move injured bodies into the hospital. Uh, and 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 that is something I feel that we always need to kind of come back to because there is a there is a human um, uh, um, kind of heroic uh, elements happening in everyday life in this war that needs to be um, 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 pointed out and uh, and uh, reflected on. So uh, I I think uh, I I. I would like to kind of to ask you, Ghassan, uh, to kind of reflect on this important role for you as a as a witness uh, of of what happened. You you managed to go in and come out, and you've been speaking so loudly and um, uh, and in a very sharp way about what what has been going on. So, how do you feel? Uh, this the role. What do you feel is the role of the doctor and the and the medics and the paramedics? in Gaza right now and the kind of the work that they are doing uh, to uh, resist, as you call, um, uh, or respond to this this incredible tragedy in, in, in the enclave? So very early on in the war, when, when um, the Israeli army started uh, uh, um, threatening hospitals by calling the medical directors and telling them they had two hours to evacuate. And I, I witnessed this phone call uh, when I was at, still at Laud, the hospital in the north, when, when the medical director received a phone call from an Israeli army officer telling him that he had two hours to evacuate uh, or else the hospital would be targeted. And then I witnessed it again when, when I was told the morning of the missile attack by the medical director of Al Ahli Baptist Hospital that he had received a similar phone call and then the following day a missile had been hit in the outer parameter of Al Ahli Hospital. Then he had gotten a second phone call from the same officer berating him for not evacuating the, uh, uh, the hospital. Uh, there was a decision made within the medical, uh, within the health professional field, you know, not just the official Ministry of Health, but, you know, Lauda is an NGO hospital working with MSF. There was a national uh, decision made that hospitals would not be evacuated because we understood that evacuating hospitals is a precursor to ethnic cleansing. That if a Jabalia camp uh, doesn't have a hospital, then it would be easier to to ethnically cleanse the Jabalia, hospital, the Jabalia camp. And that if the Baptist would evacuate, then the center part, the old part of Gaza city would, would fall easier. And so the, the resistance was, was a kind of almost at a, both an institutional level and at an individual level, because at no stage did anybody ask anybody to stay. Uh, not just out of anything but out of a sense that nobody wanted to take responsibility for anybody else's life. Uh, and so anyone who stayed, stayed uh, uh, as a personal decision. And the ma overwhelming majority of people stayed. And even those who, who, for family reasons, had to move to the South. I know that the minute they got to the South and they were satisfied their, their families were uh, in a safe place, would join the closest hospital. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's that kind of continuous movement between hospitals and every time a hospital would fall I mean it's not just uh, uh, Dr. Abed uh, 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 you know one of the junior hospitals who, uh, junior doctors who was killed by an Israeli missile at Lauda hospital uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago had moved from Shifa hospital to Lauda and once Shifa had fallen and another one had been at, at the Indonesian and then moved to Lauda when Indonesian had fallen and so all of these doctors would just continue to serve in whatever institution that they could find. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 another layer is, as you said, these acts of communalism. You know, the majority of people in Gaza now live in houses uh, with 50, 60 other people who've sought refuge in their houses with them on very tenuous relation. You know, not they're not all siblings or cousins or, or in-laws. There are people who, who are living with others based on the fact that they had been to school together or that they had worked together or that they had siblings who were friends. 
um, and everything is shared. Uh, food is shared, water is shared, medication is shared, and and even love is shared. Uh, I, I I shared with you the story uh, that stays with me uh, all the time. Um, one of the uh, one of, w- the last week uh, I was at uh, Al Ahly Hospital, um, and of a particularly difficult night where we had uh, I had done by the end of the night uh, amputations on six children. One of these kids was a, a, a three-year-old on whom I had to do a, an above, uh, an upper limb and a lower limb amputation. And he was the sole survivor of his family. We didn't know his name. And I was worried that, you know, nutritionally, when he went to the wards, that he didn't have anybody to look after him. And so the following morning, after I, I, when I rounded, I may, wanted to make sure that there's someone feeding him. And, and when I went to the, the wards uh, uh, and passed by his bed, I found that the, the mother of the wounded child in the bed next to him had him on her lap and was feeding him with her own children. And this phenomena of the wounded child with no surviving uh, family, um, of which there was around 120 at Shifa by the time the, the Israelis besieged him, um, I had another patient whose mother was a doctor at Shifa Hospital and the mother was killed and, and the siblings were killed and, and the girl was the sole survivor. And she, her care was taken over by her mother's uh, uh, colleagues in the Department of Obstetrics. And mm-hmm. just hundreds of stories like that where, where uh, uh, people choose to, 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 to resist uh, in the most uh, uh, basic yet the most uh, humane way against this brutalizing and dehumanizing violence through acts of great love that has nothing, has no biological reason and has no uh, material reason, but they're just great acts of love as a resistance to this gr- this great act of hatred. Ghassan, uh, the uh, kind of, uh, out of this, I would like to kind of, get you to uh, talk to us a little bit. You've been in different kind of conflicts before, and I've heard you say that uh, while you've been seeing other conflicts in terms of floods, this conflict for you, it looks like a tsunami. Um, so I want you to kind of a little bit contextualize for us why and how and the scale of this uh, current uh, moment in, in Gaza in relationship not only to previous wars in Gaza, but to wars that you've experienced in, in, other, in other parts of the region? So uh, if you recall, um, Omar, one of the things that we've, we always used to, you know, when we started this 12-year conversation, you and I, uh, uh, back in 2011, is how you read the war by, uh, through looking at the, at the wound as a biological archive uh, of this war. And it's really to understand this war and the whole magnitude and the intention the, uh, to understand what, what the military aim of the war is. When you drop 2,000 pound bombs on a residential home, uh, when you target, you move away from targeting buildings to targeting whole neighborhoods all at once by dropping several of these 2,000 pound bombs. Uh, when you uh, use uh, uh, white phosphorus against a, a um, refugee camp uh, in a way that, so white phosphorus explodes, the shell explodes in the sky and covers the whole area in a cap and canopy of, of, of uh, pellets. Uh, which basically on contact catch fire, but particularly with biological material. Um, when you do all of that on a scale where uh, in under uh, in 50 days you've managed to kill 20,000 people, which is 1% of the population, uh, wound 50,000, which is almost two and a bit percent of the population, kill 1% of the children in that population. Uh, you realize what the intent is. And, 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 and for me, I kind of think of this war as, as Benny Morris's war. Mm. Uh, uh, those who, of you know, who know of Benny Morris, Benny Morris 
uh, was an, is an Israeli historian who wrote his first book uh, called The Origin of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, in which he described Nakba and the massacres that were happening uh, as part of Nakba. But later had a change of heart, and I think in a series of articles at, uh, in Haart, uh, basically said that the biggest mistake and the lethal mistake that the, the Zionist movement had committed was it had allowed Palestinians to remain in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the Galilee. And then that unless uh, the Zionist movement found a solution to this problem, and he used the analogy of the uh, North Americans wiping out the natives in, in, in North America and Canada and the United States, and the Turks wiping out the Greeks in uh, uh, Western uh, uh, Turkey, Eastern Greece. Um, he, he used that analogy saying that, you know, these successful uh, colonial projects were only successful because they managed to do uh, uh, just that. And that the only salvation left to this project was to get rid of the Palestinians uh, 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 in the West Bank and Gaza. And I feel that the, looking at the injuries, the magnitude of the injuries, the types of injuries, all of this leaves you with one conclusion and also the very blatant uh, uh, statements by Israeli military uh, and political leaders leaves you with no, I mean, they have been very clear and very open. And, and I think Dichter, who used to be the Shin Beit, the, the internal security services minister, uh, said, you know, this is the second method. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you realize that the aim is is to kill uh, those who are there, uh, to ensure that those who are who survive have to leave, uh, and to make sure in the long term it becomes an in uninhabitable place for those who are more reluctant to leave in the first and second phases. Hassan, I want to pick up on that last point of uh, making life uninhabitable or. Uh, uh, and and creating that kind of dystopia of health. So I want you to kind of a little bit uh, give us an idea of uh, the not only the scale of injury, but the kind of the impossibility of healing of these wounds, the problems with uh, with the chronic pro uh, diseases that you uh, yet you mentioned. Uh, it, it, I want you to just elaborate what you called like at some point your death world. Uh, uh, so. Uh, can you can you say something about that? So the number of wounded, particularly after the first few weeks of the war, so far exceeded the capacity of the system to treat them, i.e. to close these wounds, so, so to ensure that the fractures are stabilized and the soft tissue is closed so that the healing process physiologically can begin. Uh, that the number of wounded was so so much higher than the capacity uh, um, that in a single um, air raid that had come into the emergency department at Shifa, uh, 80 to 100 patients were brought in. And so what had happened, is, and, and as you, uh, as you're capacity to treat and to, to, to properly treat and definitively treat decreased and the number of wounded increased by the end uh, 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 in the last week, 10 days at Ahli Hospital, we had over 500 wounded and only two operating rooms. And so we effectively became a, a kind of glorified first aid station where we would just bandage people and then operate on those who were you know, at death's door, basically, you know, airway <coughs> surgery, people with who are about to bleed from limbs, uh, 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 penetrating abdominal wounds, but nothing else. And so what you ended up with was this huge number of patients with festering wounds, open, massive open wounds that eventually were getting infected. And as they were getting infected, you were running out of morphine and out of ketamine. So at some stage towards the end, to prevent sepsis, particularly in children, to prevent people 
uh, uh, dying from these wound infections that were becoming beginning to smell, and the pus was staining the dressings, and it and they were spiking temperatures. We would have to, I would have to clean these wounds with a a, a solution that I had made from dishwash, uh, you know, washing up liquid uh, 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 and vinegar, uh, uh, without anesthetic and was certainly without morphine. Um, to prevent the sepsis and including it on, on children with the, with the with the consent of the parent so, so i didn't have any uh, um, ketamine i didn't have any morphine i had kids that were starting to become septic they were tachycardic they were febron and and i ended up going to the parents and explaining that you know i had to intervene but there's nothing else that i could do other than try to do it very quickly while these children were screaming uh, uh, just to, to stop them becoming septic. And, and we did that with adults too. And so there's a mountain of wounded bodies with open wounds that are now becoming infected and have become infected uh, uh, in Gaza waiting for treatment. That they, and with every passing day, I'm sure more of them are dying. Uh, more of them are in a catabolic state worsened by their malnutrition. The other, yesterday, I was thinking, with malnutrition now prevalent in Gaza, the new wounded will fare even worse than the previously wounded because they're being wounded while uh, uh, malnourished. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of uh, catastrophization. That is the self-fulfilling catastrophe that, that I was talking about at the beginning. And it and it seems and it seems like the problem here is not just about targeting or not targeting civilians, but actually creating uh, a condition where even the recovery of even civilians and and especially children with the, which are like kind of the major um, a casualty of this war uh, almost impossible. Absolutely, and, and and not just that. So so once. Once they attacked the, the pediatric hospital, we started getting kids with diabetes and, and asthma in the emergency department and with no ability to treat their, you know, DKAs and, and treat their uh, status asthmaticus in, uh, in, in any way that is akin to that of a pediatric hospital. Um, and so, uh, but, but in addition, there's also the performative part of this. So I think the whole story of the premature children, the mm -hmm. way they, they the way they were killed in a very performative way, you know, the the cutting off of fuel to Shifa so that the generators would stop. And then after that didn't work, the first thing the Israeli tanks did when they got the Shifa is that they damaged the oxygen pipes leading to the uh, uh, um the neonatal intensive care unit and the way uh, 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 that happened and then the whole refusal to allow them to be evacuated by the WHO uh, until half of them, I think, died. The way uh, in Nasser Hospital, which is the other pediatric hospital, they were laid, their dead bodies were laid out in public by the, the, the retreating uh, Israeli uh, army so that they can be seen as opposed to like any crime You'd try to bury them and bury the crime with them. That kind of performative violence is critical to the intent of uh, uninhabitability. It's mm -hmm. critical to, to, to making a place uninhabitable, that the violence in, in a lot of places needs to be very performative and very open and, and, um, uh, uh, um, and, and very specific about targeting those uh, uh, you know, like premature baby, you know, those with the most with the, the, the most emotive symbols of patienthood or or inability to defend oneself. A vulnerability. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to take you from that spectacle uh, in, back into the OR, Rasan, and, and you, you've spoken uh, several times about almost new weapons used. Uh, and I want to kind of uh, ask you a little bit more to comment on, on the kind of the surgical difficulties, uh, the, even technical difficulties that you faced in dealing with some of the uh, the horrific injuries in terms of 
um, amputation or these these bullets that leave large craters as they exit. So uh, if you can kind of guide us a little bit more through, I mean, with all the kind of the limitation of surgery that you're working in and you are dealing with very uh, almost new forms of injury and very difficult ones. So, so I want you to kind of tell us a little bit about that experience. So there, there are two layers to this. One is, is the injury itself. And one is the kind of the spiral of, of triage that you found yourself in as the numbers increased and your capacity decreased. And so with, with, with the incendiary bombs, which is, bit, which, I mean, I, I call them incendiary bombs because it was strange. The patients had 50, 60, 70% body surface area bomb uh, burns with 70% burns, but no and no blast injury. So no soft tissue damage, just just burn, just a fire bullet. And these uh, 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 consume so much in terms of material and medication and time in the OR that at, they, at some stage they became so many that effectively we had to triage out anybody with a burn over 40% because we would not be able to treat we could just couldn't treat them, and then that, uh, uh, or the 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 new Hellfire missile that we had seen, which is a fragmentary missile that disintegrates shards and discs of metal, uh, which would leave guillotine type amputations at the most uh, uh, um, unusual places. So unlike a regular explosive where the amputation happens in the weak areas, which is the joint, and the the limb is literally torn apart. These were creating guillotine-like amputations in the mid thigh, where the femur is at its thickest, and the and the muscles of the thigh were at its they were at bulky. And we started seeing, you know, I, I mean, I still hold out that that's the missile that was used at the Ali Baptist Hospital saw it several times later, the last time in an attack on a mosque, which left 60 killed and, and hundreds wounded. All mm -hmm. of the wounded had metal, had metal shards in them. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, or the phosphorus bombs and the way phosphorus just burns into the core of the body as a chemical burn. Uh, or the high velocity sniper from drones that, that would be sent to patrol the ro roads leading to Ali Hospital and leading to other hospitals and shooting at people uh, there who would come with these sniper injuries uh, from areas in the middle of the city where ground forces were nowhere, nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and then towards the end, I mean, this is one of the most horrific thing about this, this quicksand of triage. I mean, the last night, the last two nights, uh, they they so the the attack on the mosque happened. There's a there's a neighborhood where a single family lived, and they're a large working class uh, family in 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 Gaza, in Sabra uh, uh, um, neighborhood, which is part of the kind of old part of Gaza city, and and they're Gazan. They're not they're not refugees. They're they're Gazan, and. Uh, they had started using the mosque, which they had as a family built as a refuge. And the, the, this missile was fired into the mosque at the time of Isha prayers. And so you had a combination of people who were praying and people who were seeking refuge. And, and I think that fragmentary missile was used. But the, the catastrophe is when they were all brought to Ahli Hospital, which is the hospital that was the only hospital that was running, and with only two operating rooms, trying to triage those who, who you could take to the operating room when it was obvious even to the untrained eye that this wasn't happening. It became a negotiation with the family where the family would be involved in the triage and they would say, so-and-so has nine kids, take him first. Don't take him because he doesn't have any children to look after. Or, you know, beca became a kind of macabre a, a process in which you were 
infinitesimally picking people because there was your capacity to treat was infinitesimally small. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Bassam, maybe a final question before we turn to the audience. Uh, I'd like to ask you about how we can go about from here. Uh, what do we do from here? Uh, people have been uh, been getting questions about what can people do from um, from the U.S. or from other places in the world. Um, and and I want you maybe to lead into this idea of documentation. Uh, the idea that that these war wounds uh, are some kind of an archive for uh, witnessing uh, these these uh, tragedies. Um, so I want you to kind of tell us what can what can be done here. Uh, I mean, apart from the idea, I mean, there's something incredible after this. You know, what remains after this war is something really um, still unknown for many of us. Um, and 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 what is the role of the doctor? What is the role of the public health practitioner? What is the role of the of the of the concerned citizen in in this in this situation? I think first and foremost, we have to stop this war. I mean, the killing has to stop. The 280 were killed today, just today. Uh, and so uh, the killing continues and the killing has to be stopped. And after the killing is stopped, we have to make sure that the siege does not become the second uh, war weapon uh, aimed at driving everybody out, ethnically cleansing people out and denying them the treatment that they want. We then need to start understanding how, and, and you mentioned clinical and public health, how do we d approach complex clinical, and by clinical I mean both physical clinical and mental health problems that have happened on a public health epidemic scale? How do you reconstruct 70 to 80 percent of 50,000? How do you rehabilitate uh, and find prosthetics for 1,000 to 1,500 children? How do you provide mental health treatment to two and a half million? How do you, uh, uh, how do you rebuild uh, non-communicable diseases health se sector when they've just killed the only nephrologist in Gaza that took six years of postgraduate training to train, and they've just shot uh, 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 the leading limb salvage orthopedic surgeon in Gaza today, you know, Dr. Abed. Uh, how, how do you do that in a way that ensures that the aim, which is to ethnically cleanse Gaza and make it uninhabitable, does not pass? Uh, uh, and then you go to the documentation. I mean, I think on a, on a global scale, the question that this war poses is, where do we go from here? Where do we go from a war where it's acceptable to kill 10,000 children in 50 days? It's acceptable to target hospitals. It's acceptable to, to cross all of these lines that had been drawn, even if drawn with, 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 you know, hypocritically after the Second World War. What kind of war are we going to have after this war, where this is the starting point, even if... The happens in Europe or Latin America or North America or Africa. Where do we go from this war? And unless we document all of the stories that have happened in this war so that we, that, so that we fight for a return to what had been achieved after the Second World War, uh, uh, we will move on from this war to something even more horrific. Um, uh, um, uh, because we've accepted a lot of things. We've accept so, I mean, it, when you kill 10,000 kids, there's one of two things that can happen. You either decide that it's, that it's okay, and, and, and for political expedience, it's okay, because uh, it's not the crime, it's the victim and the perpetrator that determine whether uh, uh, it becomes a problem. And obviously, the perpetrator is, is, runs with impunity and the... And the and the victim uh, it doesn't count. Or you say, yeah, well, I mean, it's 10,000, but it's not like 10,000 kids in London or 10,000 kids in Berlin or 10,000 kids in Boston. These are 10,000 kids somewhere in the third world. These are brown, Muslim, Arab, Palestinian children. And therefore, it really isn't that kind of, uh, 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 it, 
goes back to kind of grievability. They're not as grievable as 10,000 other kids in Stockholm or Copenhagen. And so the, these are the only two conclusions that you can, because if you don't wake up every morning thinking how absolutely monstrous and catastrophic we've come to the point where we can do that to 10,000 children in 50 days, then, then uh, you can only come up with these two possible answers. Otherwise, you need to kind of turn back and say, say, what has led us to this point where this has become acceptable? This is beyond the kind of Arab-Israeli question or beyond the question of Palestine. This is a kind of global question. And, and documenting these stories is a critical component to, to forcing the world to, to come up with these answers. Right. And I, and I think at the center of this is this uh, the the idea that healthcare has become kind of in at the at the core of these catastrophe making um, uh, projects right now, and 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 the and and it really what you're kind of highlighting is this limit even of this idea of humanitarianism, the hum limits of humanitarian logic, and in many ways, if we don't kind of come back and revisit this, then we are dealing with really corrupt. Uh, a soul of humanity um, uh, that kind of can easily witness and watch something like this and unable to do anything about it. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, thank you, Ghassan, very much for for this. I'm I'm gonna be uh, uh, opening maybe uh, for the public questions Q and A for the public. I hope uh, we am and others can help us uh, in channeling the questions uh, uh, to yes. Ghassan. Thank you both. So maybe um, we'll, we can pick up. I'm trying. I've tried to sort of group as many as possible because there are more questions than we have time to answer. Um, but maybe if we pick up on that last point um, in terms of um, just thinking about like the limits of humanitarianism, and there are a few questions related to that, the response of the international community and the frustration with some of that response. So how do you how do you explain sort of the the response that we've seen so far, and what do you think are the main impediments um, moving forward? So, so uh, on a micro level or an organizational level, what is frustrating with regards to the response of the uh, uh, response of the uh, uh, UN aid, or even the international agencies, is how the response happens in that space that is allowed by the Israeli, uh, uh, rather than the responses determined by a set of international laws and humanitarian laws governing uh, not only the conduct of war, but the conduct of these international agents. Uh, um, Abu Salmiya is arrested from a WHO, uh, uh, WHO um, convoy that had, be, had been given assurances that it would be free to pass. The WHO's response is, is, is woefully inadequate. And the idea of sanctions on the Israeli or even suspending the Israeli from the, the General Assembly of the World Health Organization is not even considered. And so uh, uh, the response is happening uh, at a kind of level of acquiescence of the omnipotence and the finality of Israeli will. You know, there's the, we know that, that Gaza needs urgent, urgently, we need field hospitals, but none will be allowed in because uh, 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 the Israelis said no. Uh, we know that there is massive malnutrition, but not enough food will be allowed in because we, because that is the Israeli will. And everybody works at beneath the ceiling that the Israelis impose. Uh, with impunity, uh, or try to work around it and improve the efficiency of the humanitarian response within the limitations really will. That's um, important. My, um, so th there are a few, I mean, you raised this issue also in terms of the wound, and like Ahmed also um, touched on this, and we have a few questions related to uh, are these wounds or are these like what you are seeing clinically? Is there documentation of this? And the, can the and if there is documentation or data, to what extent can that be used um, for advocacy to try to push 
um, whether it's humanitarian organizations, health organizations, or international organizations forward? I think, uh, you know, we live in a world where this is th these people are being slaughtered uh, uh, um, uh, live on social media and on TV. I, we, th this is not something that's happening somewhere in a faraway corner and, and we get newspaper reports a few days later or a week later about the numbers. Uh, and so the idea of, of that somehow this is not being documented properly is actually uh, not true. Uh, and it beggars the question about the futility of witnessing when the decision is, to not, is not to see. Uh, uh, you know, someone was asking me the other day, I was asked the other day about the press conference that I was, I gave, I gave uh, evidence in a press conference uh, just after the, the Ahli Baptist hospital. And uh, uh, if you rec if you'd seen this video, the, the Ministry of Health had put a lot of the bodies uh, uh, on uh, show. And I was told, is this uh, uh, grotesque? Is this a violation of the privacy of, of those who are killed? And it made me think about why, you know, the, 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 when people in Gaza were, were, were holding their dead children, where they would run and try to put the child's body in front of the camera because Palestinians still cannot process that uh, ignorance is an active process. You know, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of work has, has gone into how unknowing is not a passive process, it's an active process. Uh, but, but for a lot of Palestinians, including you know, Palestinian doctors who thought that if the world saw all of these bodies, it would step back from allowing yet another hospital to be targeted. Uh, 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 that's, you know, that this, this idea of that somehow uh, uh, the absence of proper documentation is what's allowing the massacre to, to take place is just not true. People are seeing people being butchered live, you know, in great detail. Uh, uh, multimedia um, and unknowing and uncaring is is an active process by the rest of the world. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think also what you touched on earlier with the dehumanization and, and who are we allowed to grieve and who's grievable um, is really important. But there were a few questions around this documentation that were less about the advocacy part, but also if we are thinking in terms of, um, you know, people who work in health research, let's say broadly speaking, and we wanted to understand kind of the long-term impact, whether it's like the, the slow violence, the environmental impact of these bombs, uh, the long-term impact of these physical and psychological wounds on the population. Is there something that we could be doing now um, to try to make sure that we have data to work with to kind of to then assess uh, or analyze these longer term. Um, if I if I may jump in here, also kind of to uh, uh, add something here, I think I think uh, uh, the other kind of question, uh, Rasan, about the documentation has to do with litigation, uh, and this is something you've been now actively uh, involved in as someone who's given testimony. Uh, there are a lot of uh, human right, uh, cases against uh, the Israeli state being kind of. Put together, and I think the importance here of uh, systematically documenting um, that goes beyond the kind of the research element, but also to uh, deal with questions around uh, justice and around kind of um, uh, bringing this into into the international court. Uh, the, the 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 conflict is the war is documented, but you cannot imagine in certain in places in the West how much censorship has been um, uh, put uh, to, together to to prevent actually seeing uh, what we usually see in 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 the ave in the avenues and the platforms that we are used to. So so yeah, it's it's an incredible. Um, there's so many different uh, aspects to this notion of of. Uh, kind of failure of witnessing also that you're talking about. But I mean, I, I, uh, we am, I completely agree. On multiple levels, the documentation is critical for uh, proper litigation, for re reinvigorating uh, uh, um, accountability within international law framework. Uh, 
uh, with with regards to understanding the size of the calamity and so in order to be able to plan a response to this public health catastrophe it's critical for us to document it so we can understand it so we can better plan for it uh, 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 but also on a palestinian level uh, as the kind of you know nakba part 2 creating our own archive of this uh, uh, pivotal moment in Palestinian history uh, uh, so that we don't end up like the first Nakba, relying on other people's archives to try to understand what happened in mm. the future. It's also critical and, 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 and you know, there'll be lots of work. I know that the Institute for Palestine Studies is, is looking at collecting uh, and documenting, uh, 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 has a project on documenting the whole health system and what happened to the health system in all its aspects. And so that documentation is, is critical on multiple levels, but it's critical for us rather than for changing the outcome on the other side, because unseeing is an active process. Mm -hmm. That's an important point. Um, and maybe I can direct a question to Ahmed here on this point, because you have experience like in Iraq and in other uh, conferences. Is there... Is what we're seeing in terms of what um, Ghassan is talking about, like as the unseeing, as this refusal of the international community to really act, um, even though there might be, you know, there there is a push, but we're seeing that constantly being vetoed by the U.S. and other um, and other uh, powers as well. Is this something that is similar to your experience in Iraq or other places, or or is there something quite distinct about Gaza in this particular moment? Well, I mean, I, I think the, the issue that Ghassan raised is this idea of lack of, of accountability. Um, you know, what do you do when about half a million kids are killed during sanctions uh, due to the sanctions? And there is no one becomes accountable for that, uh, for for these kind of crimes. Uh, what happens when when under the kind of the, the framing of terrorism, you can kind of go and destroy hospitals destroy homes destroy lives um uh and 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 uh, really no accountability has emerged from a place like iraq and i think this is uh, something that we we see uh, in a very um, ho horrifying way in in gaza i think in a in a one of the kind of the biggest uh, challenges that this war has brought in is not that it's also a war on healthcare and destruction, but then the people are marooned in a place where are unable to even uh, move anywhere to to escape the the bombing, and also they don't want to move uh, uh, because that's their land. Um, so so there's there's a lot of uh, uh, similarities with how uh, the West forgets. Uh, about these these major crimes, these effects. I mean, you know, 20 years of the war on terror in Afghanistan and in Iraq have produced millions of of, of uh, uh, people dead and uh, so much destruction and so much agony and so much kind of loss. But, you know, but then all of this really not kind of, you don't come back to to deal with it. I feel with this conflict, there is definitely a more of a much bigger solidarity at the international level uh, that I'm hoping people like Hassan and others will be able to kind of uh, galvanize more efforts and more uh, documentation and more pushback uh, against these kind of um, uh, uh, horrendous uh, acts of violence that we see there. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, so I know uh, Hassan actually has to leave quite uh, soon. So I'm just, um, and we apologize that we haven't been able to get through all of the questions, but I think multiple people have asked about ways forward and that was Ahmed's first question, but maybe it's worth going back to that question. What is it that people can do, whether it's within the medical and health community, but also um, more broadly? And are there initiatives or organizations that you would um, suggest that people try uh, to be more involved in or provide um, financial or other support to? So um, with regards to, I mean, as citizens, they need to be involved in the, in the anti-war movement. Uh, uh, that's the critical aspect. Of it. As citizens moving forward from this war, there needs to be uh, by those concerned with health or working within health or public health 
framework a a struggle to re-establish the rule of international law and international humanitarian law and the and the laws governing the war. In terms of the humanitarian response, there are lots of organizations that um, are gearing up once there is some rest, uh, some end to the killing, uh, uh, in reaching out and providing medical care for uh, uh, the wounded. Palestine Children's Relief Fund, Medical Aid for Palestinians, uh, MSF, and so it, it, within the and and lots of organisations are looking at ways to get involved in the mental health uh, uh, um, aid, and so there are lots of ways to kind of in terms of humanitarian care, and in terms of academic reaching out to Palestinian academics uh, whose university have been destroyed in Gaza to find out how they can be supported, reaching out to students of these universities that now face a bleak and uncertain future with regards to their education is a critical part of what we can do. And so there's multiple layers that we can respond. But most importantly, we have to push for an, an end to the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. And thank you, Omar, for your time and your expertise. Um, we're already, I know how busy uh, you both are. And I'm sure also, Hassan, I know you've been... <laughs> especially busy um, these last few weeks. So we really do appreciate you giving us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to our audience for uh, being with us. I just have like a few small announcements. So there were, there were several questions about um, the recording and there, this is recorded and we will make the recording available as soon as possible. Um, so please do check our website. Um, we're also going to be including information on how and um, on how you can join our mailing list. So you can find that in the uh, chat box. If you want to be included um, in our mailing list, uh, list so that you can find out about events and other programming, um, please do sign up and you can always go uh, back to our website. Um, and one final, and, and we'll have a whole set of uh, new webinars um, in the coming year as well that we'll advertise. And just one final note, we do have a fellowship call open um, for next year. Um, and we're especially keen to have somebody that um, works on that intersection between international human rights law and health um, to be in residence um, in, uh, at the FXB Center in next year. And the applications are due January 15th, so you can go to our website to find more information. Um, if, um, yeah, if you're personally interested or if you know others, please do uh, share the call um, with others. And that's it for us today. And thank you all again. And thank you for all the work that you have been doing. And uh, we'll keep everyone posted on next steps um, that we can be a part of as well.